This is the WGBH Forum Network. The Creative Method. The National Association of Educational Broadcasters presents Eric Bentley on translation. Here first is Lyman Bryson. One often thinks of translation as the least appreciated of the arts. Is it creative at all? What reason does the man in the street have to think of the translator as a creative artist? This is the question with which Mr. Eric Bentley opens his talk. If you know your own street well, or people who live on your block in your apartment house, wouldn't you despair of reproducing their way of speaking in, say, Chinese? Because China is a different place. And if you know China well, you will know people on the block there too, and the problem will seem not easier, but harder, when you think how the Chinese speak on their streets. Oh yes, we can find out how both sets of people say beware of the dog. We can learn what sound to make when asking for butter in a store. But can we say to a Chinese friend, I will now show you in Chinese how Americans talk on American streets. The man who has assumed translation to be easy is thinking wrongly not only of language, but even more of geography, of history. He is failing to reckon with the differences between peoples, and that is the main stumbling block of the translator. You're listening to Eric Bentley on translation. The Creative Method. The Translator as Creator, one of ten essays by Creative Americans about the nature of their work. The Creative Method, prepared by WGBHFM in Boston, under a grant from the National Educational Television and Radio Center. Later, we'll tell you how you may obtain excerpts from this and 21 other radio essays on the creative process in American arts, sciences, and professions. But now, Eric Bentley on translation. And here is Mr. Bentley. What is translation? It is the transference of the meaning of words from one language to another. A translation is imperfect if anything is added or if anything is taken away. And by anything here, I mean anything whatever that can be conveyed by words. What do words convey? Thoughts and feelings. They have a center of thought, and around that center are clustered the feelings, some of which are there because the speaker wants them there, some of which are there because he can't help them being there. They adhere to the words and did so before he started speaking. For language is the opposite of a raw material. The writer's material, his collaborator in a sense, is the people as they surround him on the street and as they stretch back behind him down the corridor of history. What follows? Nothing if not this, that all translation is imperfect. Even if the translator's mind were a better instrument than it ever is, it is not conceivable that he could transfer meaning from one language to another without addition or subtraction because the life of one nation does not correspond point for point with another. And so the translator's life begins, one might say, on the other side of impossibility. Or one might make this formulation. All translations are bad. In that case, one would have to add, but some are not as bad as others. And then, what would the criteria be of badness, of goodness? On this question, there have been different opinions, ranging between two extremes, literalness, on the one hand, and freedom, on the other. Someone will point out at once, I'm sure, that freedom here is not a very exact term. There are degrees of it. Actually, literalness is no more exact. Its meaning varies according to the number of words under consideration. For example, what would be a literal tra French translation of the American colloquialism for crying out loud? 
not in this case taking each word separately, not even taking the words together. The phrase will not be translated at all until the whole notion of word-for-word -word correspondence is dropped. In which case, how could a free translation of the phrase be any different from a literal one? I conclude that a person has still not explained himself when he tells me he favors the literal or he favors the free, since there are degrees of each, and there are places also where both meet. Let us therefore begin at the other end and assert a simple fact, which is this, that some translators pride themselves on their fidelity to the original, while others pride themselves equally on the imagination which has enabled them to find something justifiably different. It is curious how in this discussion moral terms always come in. Fidelity, justification. And when we hear the exclamation, the translation is terrible, and we often hear that, it often means not that the translator hasn't done what he set out to do, but that the speaker disapproves of what the translator set out to do. And his disapproval doesn't stop short of outrage. People who favor closer translation regard the less close as frivolous, as commercial, while those who favor freer translations regard closer ones as necessarily dull, boring, pedestrian, mediocre. And hence this is scarcely a subject one discusses. Rather, one hurls accusations, one voices suspicion, one records one's contempt. I would not wish to sit in a broadcasting studio with translators of these rival schools because I hate family quarrels. They are too violent. Instead, I am going to keep the antagonists from each other's throats by quoting them in their absence. Here is a champion of close translation writing a letter to his own translator. He writes, Translate with strict literalness, word for word, and comma for comma. Under no circumstances whatever, put in an and that is not in the original. Every and you inserted I have had to strike out. Adhere closely to my commas, to my semicolons, to my periods. Do not under any circumstances connect sentences which I have separated. Consider further that the transfer of a German melody, this is a German writer I'm quoting, Consider that the transfer of a German melody to an English one can only be understood in this sense, that my exact cadence, my rhythm, my melody should be set to English words, not that anything else whatsoever should be put in its place. That's the end of my quote from Count Kaiserling, a German writer addressing his English translator. What could be more natural than the wish that the Count expresses. All he wants is to be perfectly translated. Too bad the touchiness, the vanity, etc., prevent him from seeing that this is impossible. No, if the impossible doesn't happen, he will blame the translator. So you see that the translator's position is hardly an enviable one. Not only is his task impossible, per se, but the people he works for will declare it quite possible and blame him personally for every deviation from that impossible perfection. After this extreme and indeed rather absurd demand for closeness in translation, it is refreshing to turn to a champion of free translating, and I have chosen Edward Fitzgerald, who freely translated Omar Khayyam's Rubaiyat. In a letter he wrote to James Russell Lowell, we find Fitzgerald saying, Apropos of his renderings from the Spanish, he was a translator of the Spanish playwright Calderon, we find him saying this, Very many besides myself, with as much dramatic spirit, knowledge of good English and English verse, would do quite as well as you think I do if they would not hamper themselves with forms of verse and thought irreconcilable with English language and English ways of thinking. I am persuaded that to keep life in the work, as drama must, the translator, however inferior to his original, must recast that original into his own likeness, more or less. The less like his original, so much the worse, but still, the, life, the live dog 
better than the dead lion. In writing this, Fitzgerald had in mind a rival translator of Calderon who applied the principle of closeness. He applied it particularly to phonetics, making his verse sound like the Spanish. Now, let's consider that for a moment, the effort of a writer in English to make his translated verse sound like Spanish verse. Calderon's Spanish verse does not suggest a foreign language to Spaniards. Why should an English rendering suggest a foreign language to Englishmen? In logic, there would be no reason, and in brute fact, the consequences are disastrous, like every attempt in art to go against, instead of with, the grain of your materials. The fact that each vowel or consonant corresponds to the Spanish vowel and consonant will not be registered by the English ear, because we do not listen in speech to sounds in themselves, as we do in music. We listen, as it were, to the sense, and we feel the sound is somehow borne along in the train of the sense. Knowing that all translation is imperfect, when we have to choose between hurting our native language and failing to do justice to the other language, we cannot choose to hurt our native language. Or, in other words, accuracy must not be bought at the expense of English. Since we cannot have everything, we would rather surrender accuracy than we would style. This, I think, is the very first principle of good translation, though it is not yet accepted in academic circles. The clinching argument in favor of this principle is, I believe, that finally, bad English cannot be accurate translation, really, unless the original is bad German, bad French, or what have you. In using here the term good, in contrast to bad, I have in mind, as I hope has been taken for granted, not just correctness of grammar, but also cogency, persuasiveness, the latter quality being the result of writing in the grain and not against it. The next problem that arises in this business of translation is, once we are committed to getting a foreign text into positively persuasive English, how far does that take us from our first and awkward literal draft? And on what resources may we legitimately draw? Edward Fitzgerald does not beat about the bush, but comes right out with an answer. He says, The translator, however inferior to his original, must recast that original in his own likeness. The blunt statement seems to concede to the literalists all that they would wish to have conceded. Your free translator leaves the original author behind and presents himself as a substitute. This, we may feel inclined to say, is not translation at all. This is original work that is indebted like a play of Shakespeare's to certain known sources. However, those who rush into these declarations are forgetting or denying the main premise, that pure and complete translation, translation is generally conceived by the ignorant, is a chimera, is a fiction. Once you admit that a lot is lost when a writer is sequestered from his native language, you have to ask the question, shall published translations simply be the original, minus all these inevitable losses, or, and here comes our new point, shall something be added? Most people, I think, will at this point be prepared to countenance additions, provided they also receive certain guarantees. Well, if any additions at all are permitted, of what sort can they be? One sort has already been mentioned by implication. If we write persuasive English, we are deploying resources, rhetorical and otherwise, that were not available to the writer in the original. Abandoning, for example, the Alexandrines, or twelve-syllable lines, of Racine, one must draw on alternative English resources. Now, in English, we don't have the twelve-syllable line as a workable medium. Most writers would try blank verse, the ten-syllable line. If one has mastered this medium, one will then inevitably produce felicities, which are not, which could not be, prompted by the French original. Here we see the sense in which translation is creative. Fully to appreciate it, you'd have to extend my point.
far beyond the boundaries of blank verse to all the other resources of our language. Here it may be objected that while I'm talking about our traditional resources as a blank verse, Edward Fitzgerald went much further and encouraged the translator to make use of his own personal resources. But here again, it's only the candor of Fitzgerald's concession that is startling. The point is one you can scarcely reject. Literature, including the literature of translation, cannot be assembled by impersonal scientific methods. The only way in which English can be alive is by springing from a particular head and heart. Hence, translation cannot but bear some signs of the translator's personality. However, I do think it would be fair to ask Fitzgerald how many signs, and which ones, for he is presumably not denying the possibility of impertinent intrusions, extrinsic additions. What is pertinent? What is intrinsic? With these questions we come to the very heart of our subject. There is perhaps no translator so free that he would acknowledge no distinction between his translations and original works. What is the difference between an original work derived from a foreign source, say, and the freest conceivable translation? Every writer knows at least his difference of attitude in the two situations. With original work, he is free to make any changes of the source that might seem of interest. But with even the freest translation, he is still not free in that way. He has a responsibility to the other man, the author. Nor can the arrangement be called a collaboration, for the other man has no responsibility to the translator. It is a purely one-way relationship. And actually we know that the claim of the free translator is almost invariably, in practice, that he has done better by the original than the close translator would do not that he has done something else or gone off on his own. His claim is, in other words, is not to have deviated, added, improved, so much as it is to have found what he will call equivalents, recreations. Though often I speak now of actual translators rather than ideal ones, though often he is nervous lest people suspect him of not knowing the other language well enough, he is also extremely proud, for he is convinced that where others use mere knowledge, he uses brains and imagination. The literal translators, he thinks, are plotters, whereas he is a genius. And indeed, no less certain than that there are many plotters in this world is the fact that there are some geniuses, including geniuses of translation. But no more than in other fields, are these geniuses exempt from the responsibilities of plotting? In either case, the starting point is a good knowledge of at least two languages. Very few people are really bilingual, but to be a first-rate translator one really ought to be. If one is not, as I, for example, am not, one needs collaborators or helpers. To marry a foreign wife can be a useful measure to take if she also knows a good deal of English. The academic discussion of translating seldom gets beyond this point, for while you are still only discussing the avoidance of howlers, etc., you are weighing the professional qualifications of your translators, not estimating their positive powers. The translator genius adds to his perfect knowledge of both languages the creative mastery of his own. If he is truly a translator genius and not just a genius translating, it will be his nature to enter into other writers and not feel limited by so doing because he finds his joy and his fulfillment precisely in an act of empathy and recreation. He resembles rather the critic than the poet in this respect that it is his pleasure to interpret others. Though the critic judges where the translator reiterates, both try to enter, as it were, the soul of the artist both hope to return from this trip and say to the world, and this is what he is really like. I intend no kind of mystical or even supernatural theory. I am referring to facts that one day may be describable scientifically. When we discover that it is a mistake to translate word by word, we must not exaggerate the degree of freedom that is then ours. <laughs>
One still does not draw words from the air. One still does not call on inspiration. Here is what Boris Pasternak writes on this part of my theme. Pasternak says, the relationship between the original and the translation is one of base and derivative, stem and cutting. A translation must issue from an author who has been acted upon by the original at a point in time long before he undertakes his work. Having admitted that perfect or complete translation is impossible, can we be content to say, then let the aim be to be as nearly perfect as we can? I think this is too vague, too general to have any practical force. One needs an aim more definite, not an approximation to a fictitious goal. And again, I take from Boris Pasternak a suggestion as to what such a goal might be. He writes, Translations are either meaningless or else they are more closely connected with the original than we usually believe. Mere accord of texts, word for word, is too weak a bond. A pale retelling gives no idea of the chief aspect of the thing which translations undertake to reflect, namely, the original impact of the work. And when we look around us, we recall how many translations are neither pale retellings, nor are they so remote from the original that experts have to warn us off them altogether. The supreme example that I have in mind is the King James, King James translation of the Bible. Last question. Why are there not more good translations? Some of the reasons lie outside the problems of the craft. The public does not demand good translations, and so publishers and theatrical producers are not forced into finding them. Economics often favors bad translations, as the other day, for example, when Madame Bovary was reissued in a bad translation because the only really good one would have cost the publisher money on royalties. Many bad translations are in the public domain. If good new ones are commissioned, the translators have to be paid. When there is no old translation, as with new foreign books, the publisher finds all too many hands willing to do a worse job for less money. And so publishers deal mainly in bad literal translations. The theatre deals mainly in bad free ones. I've tried to show how narrowly transcribed is the free translator's freedom, if he is really good. But the theatre offers the larger freedom, which is total irresponsibility. The translator is relieved of his responsibility to his author. He is responsible to his producer, his director, his actor, or even to his own unreliable intuitions as to what will pay. Sometimes when these all-too-free adaptations are published, the outraged original author commissions a faithful translation, which is published too. If the adapter has exhibited all the faults of freedom run mad, the new translator may well, however, illustrate the limitations of the pedant, the literalist. A playwright, then, translated twice, has been translated not at all. I've been speaking throughout of two types of translation, the more literal and the less literal, the more free and the less free, the strict or the close, and the adaptation. These correspond not just to two ideas, which one obtains by thinking, but to two actual groups of people in our society very much alive and kicking. I work with translators all the time, and it isn't often that I come upon one who isn't an extremist in one of these two directions, either too literal or too free, and usually has all the characteristics that you would expect to go with either psychological type, such as that the free ones tend to be very careless, and the strict ones tend to be very pedantic. So it becomes, in the end, a personal problem, and I thought I would end on this note because... I thought that my talk might have some educational point if it suggested that there is a very large territory between the two extremes, between the two poles. A better way of putting it might be to say a synthesis is needed of two kinds 
of expertness, two kinds of talent. I'm not proposing any kind of revolutionary change. I don't think anything like that will happen. But if anyone on either side had just a slightly open mind, it would already help a good deal. I don't expect the door to fly open, but if only it were just slightly ajar. Eric Bentley on translation. And here again is our host and commentator for The Creative Method, Lyman Bryson. Mr. Bentley made it clear, I think, in the conclusion of his talk, why one should properly regard translation as a creative art, but he also made it clear why there are so few good translations. It goes back to a remark that I made in the beginning, that translation is an unappreciated art. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to pay for it. Nobody pays much attention to who translates a great book. And uh, in general, the man in the street doesn't think of the translator as anybody else but a kind of a messenger boy between the original creator and the, uh, the reader himself. As a matter of fact, a very great translator, I suppose, can't help making another work of art, something which is uh, an analog or a parallel to the work of the original poet or dramatist who is being, or novelist who is being translated, but something which, if it has great power or great beauty, has it in its own right, because after all, it's in another language, and every language has its own way of saying whatever it is that it is important to say. Between the poet and, or the dramatist and the native reader, the person who speaks the same language, there is, of course, a great deal of co in common. There's much less in common between me and somebody to whom German or Russian or French is a native language than there would be between the original writer and the native speaker. The translator, of course, has to face this difficulty and do what he can with it. But when one looks at translation, not only as an art, but as a social activity, we realize that a great deal of what we say these days about uh, friendship between people of different cultures, friendship between people of different nations, in which we hope art will make a great contribution because the creative spirit moves in all men of all races and all cultures, if we really want this to get anywhere, we have to uh, depend somewhat on the translator uh, because nobody has the time to learn all the languages of the earth and few of us ever have time to learn more than our own so with any great confidence. In addition to his translation work, of course, Mr. Bentley has written on his own, particularly about the theater. He has one book, What is Theater? He's edited six volumes of modern theater and three volumes of classical theater. But in his translation, very seriously, he's going at the task of helping us to bridge the difference, the abyss almost, it seems sometimes, between our culture and the English language and uh, the cultures which express themselves in other European languages, something which uh, is now uh, one of our chief tasks in reconstructing our world. In this, we depend heavily upon creative art, and the translator is a key figure in that effort. Thank you, Dr. Bryson. You've heard Eric Bentley, the translator as creator, one of ten essays furthering our understanding of creativeness in American arts and professions. The Creative Method is recorded by WGBH-FM in Boston under a grant from the National Educational Television and Radio Center. Producer Jack D. Summerfield with Lorlan Thatcher and Bill Kavnis as production associates. This is the National Educational Radio Network.